Okay, so this is the Integrative uh, Seminar Research Series, okay, organized by the Department of uh, Information and, and Computation Technologies. Uh, and uh, my name is Hector Geffner, as Albert said, so I'm the, one of the organizers. And uh, today is my pleasure to introduce myself. Okay, uh, okay so uh, to make the story short about the introduction, uh, I arrived to Barcelona and to Icrea and to the Pompeu Fauda at the end of 2001. Okay, that makes me uh, one of the first generation actually Icrea, that's first, uh, first call. I'm probably one of the oldest guys okay, in the department as, as well. Before coming to Barcelona, I was a professor in Caracas, in the Simón Bolívar University. And before that, I was a researcher in the uh, IBM TJ Watson Research Center in New York. And before that, I did a PhD at UCLA uh, under the supervision of Julia Pearl, that is, is, is very well known as, as the father of, of Bayesian networks. Okay, So I'll uh, try to give sort of a relatively general talk Okay, that will touch uh, some of the things that we do um, in the group. So I'll start first uh, with the group. Okay, so I'm a proud Carl Karin member of uh, this group, this is the AI group. As you see, we have many people, okay, so many good people, okay, we don't have that many women, okay, that's uh, uh, okay, so uh, maybe I can uh, quickly introduce again okay, people here that you often see and do not know the name. So Jorge is a collaborator, okay, he's uh, a degree professor. Then we have uh, Jonathan, we have Filippos, we have Damir, Osam, we have uh, Guillem, there are students, there are some missing students as well. Then Gergo, Vicenz, and Dimitri are UPF fellows. Uh, Victor is a professor, and there's a professor. Uh, Gabor is a professor, but not in our department, okay? He has chosen to endanger his soul working in the Department of Economics, okay? Uh, nobody's perfect, and Sergio is uh, Juan de la Sierra uh, a fellow, okay? Some of you may have been at the talk I gave a few months ago in the CCB, so part of the talk, okay, will be common, uh, uh, part will be new. I'll try to make some new jokes, though, okay? That, that will, you can count that one. Okay, um, okay, so one of the uh, one of the things okay about AI is that AI is very much in the news okay in the last few years. And one of the things that brings AI to the news are some developments, some applications and so on, and also some fears. Okay, for instance, this is uh, uh, an article in The Guardian, okay, uh, Elon Musk, okay, uh, uh, warning that artificial intelligence is our biggest existential threat. So we have a few others, okay, like uh, Bill Gates in the Washington Post. Okay, I don't understand why some people are not concerned, okay, and even a physicist, okay, Stephen Hawking, saying that artificial intelligence could wipe out humanity when it gets too clever as, as humans will be like ants. Okay, so many fears. So the question is, uh, is, is this fear justified? Has AI uh, been solved or something close to that? And in order to alleviate this fear, okay, so I'll show you a couple of videos and, uh, and then we can relax and, and, uh, and enjoy the talk. So this is this one, if it works, okay, sorry, it doesn't. So how does it work? Okay. Okay, so this one is from the DARPA challenge of 2015. This means this is last year. Okay, so the task is for the robot to get inside uh, the house. Okay, and uh, you see that it's not a, a problem that is so simple. It's thinking about it, uh, finally found the handle. Okay, and uh, and this reflects a little bit, okay, some of the challenges, okay, current challenges in AI and robotics. Okay, you can, you may think that this is a, an accident, okay, and, uh, and so on, but actually uh, was not the only accident in, uh, okay, here a few more, okay, very quickly, so we get to see the same one, okay, but actually the task is not so 
easy, okay? So one of the nice things about artificial intelligence is that you start valuing even the most stupid things, okay? So in a sense, the computational perspective is very generous on the human condition. Even the most stupid things are very challenging, okay, for artificial intelligence, as opposed to some of the things that in principle do not uh, require, appear to require some intelligence. So uh, uh, basically the plan for the talk is, so I'll, I'll talk some uh, general uh, themes like, uh, so what is AI and a little bit of the history, so why it's now in the media, um, and again, so a lot uh, of this is because of some, the success of some machine learning techniques, so I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, and then I'll focus on some of the things that we do in the group. I will not be talking about everything that is done in the group. There are many things that, uh, many uh, research lines in the AI group, some in which I'm not involved at all, actually, and there isn't a strong machine learning process as well. So I'll talk just about the planning part that is related to this idea of general intelligence. So if we have time, then I'll talk some philosophy and, and, and uses and risk, okay, because there are certain, even uh, the robots may be not taken uh, uh, over the world yet, okay, there are actually some dangers, okay, that have to do, for instance, about losing jobs and, and things uh, like that. So uh, the joke that I want to make about this video is actually two jokes, okay, because uh, this is one about opening the door. Another sort of challenge in 2015 for the first time is Amazon, okay, started the so-called Amazon Picking Challenge. And the Amazon Picking Challenge is to have robots that can pick things from shelves. As you know, uh, Amazon uses robots, but uses robots to move shelves, okay? Why to move shelves to operators? Because it cannot retrieve the items. So rather than retrieving the item, it retrieves the shelf that contains the item and brings the whole shelf to the operator that is sitting somewhere, okay? So uh, to uh, take home lessons for this first part, if the robots actually take over, okay, the world, so for the time being, you can be safe if you close the door, okay? <laughs> That's first thing. And noticing what's happening with the Amazon uh, picking challenge, if the robots actually uh, get into the house and they ask you for the keys, all you have to do is they are on the shelf, okay? And you will be pretty safe as well. So let's get going. So artificial intelligence is, is a branch of computer science, okay? And uh, it studies intelligent behavior from a very particular perspective, okay? So the computational point of view. So it uses a very peculiar type of of a telescope, okay, uh, understanding a behavior from the point of view of artificial intelligence is to be able to generate the behavior by, uh, by in a computer. Sometimes in the computer you need also uh, uh, some sort of body like sensors and actuators, okay, like if you want a robot, okay, to do some cooking, not in the market uh, yet, okay, so this activity X maybe uh, solving the puzzle, recognizing an object in a meme image, okay, understanding a story, a joke, okay, doing the dishes, okay, many, many things, okay. So understanding means I can get a computer to do it. And this is very challenging, not only on things that in principle require intelligence, okay. Uh, um, okay, so the brand, uh, actually would say that the father of artificial intelligence is Alan Turing, okay, is one of the greatest scientists, okay, in the 20th century and definitely one of the heroes in computer science and artificial intelligence, okay. Uh, Turing was the, 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 first, the first guy who developed a universal programmable computer, okay. So anything that a computer now can do, okay, was possible to be done in, a, in the machine, okay, that Turing envisioned, okay, this is a Turing machine, okay, just in paper, an infinite tape, okay, a head that can move to the left and the right, depending on what's on the tape, and a controller state, okay, that can, the machine that can be in several controller states, that's a Turing machine, anything that can be computed, okay, but a computer now could be computed by uh, pencil and paper, okay, with the uh, machine that Turing devised in 1930. Uh, six. Actually, uh, the current machines will go faster, but still, all the analysis of complexity about different types of problems are still, okay, 
uh, use the Turing machine. So we say that a problem is NP hard, NP complete, okay, we'll come to that later, is basically by analyzing Turing machines, not actually the current computers. Another thing that is worth emphasizing, okay, about this work uh, by Turing is that often you hear about applied research, basic research, and so on, and nobody will question the fact that uh, uh, computers are, are useful, okay? Okay, so you carry them in your pockets, okay, to talk to people, uh, uh, you can buy tickets to, to, uh, to the concert, or whatever, okay? But the goal of Turing was not practical at all, okay? So these problems could not be farther from the mind of Turing at that time, uh, Turing devised this machine, okay, that is the blueprint, okay, from the computers that we have today, uh, by trying to tackle a very abstract mathematical problem that was posed at the beginning of the 20th century by a, a mathematician, okay, David Hilbert. Hilbert wanted to know at the beginning of the 20th century whether it was possible to mechanize proofs in predicate logic, okay, what we call first order logic or predicate logic. And at that time, there were no computers, there were no way to mechanize okay, the process. So uh, Turing basically came up with this idea of these universal computers, okay, just to have a theory of what it means a mechanized process to solve this problem. And actually, the way that he solved this sort of conjecture or this problem posed by Hilbert is by showing that that's impossible. Okay? Turing showed that proving theories in predicate logic is an undecidable problem, meaning there is no Turing machine okay, that can solve the problem in finite time, meaning there is no computer now or in 100 years that will solve uh, uh, this problem in finite time either. This is an undecidable problem. We'll see that also for the frontier between problems that are polynomial and non-polynomial, we still use, okay, the idea of the Turing machine as well. Turing is also a father of artificial intelligence that published in, in 1950, okay, four years before uh, he committed suicide, uh, one of the first AI papers, well, that's where the idea of the, the Turing test, okay, came and uh, the name of the movie, okay, the name of the movie, okay, that some of you may have seen recently, The Imitation Game, comes actually from the Turing test and has little to do with what goes on in the movie. It is about decrypting, okay, it goes from the, uh, from the Nazis at that time. Okay, this was in the early 50s, okay, by the end of the 50s is that the discipline of artificial intelligence, okay, takes some shape, okay, some of the founders, okay, are here, some are well known, like Claude Shannon, okay, McCarthy, Minsky, okay, that passed away not long ago, and uh, basically the beginnings of the slogan in, in, in was so, something, if somebody will claim that machines cannot do X, so the task is to disprove the uh, skeptics by writing a program that does X, okay? So that was in some sense the idea, from a methodological point that was not too good, but in some sense it was the computer, the program of the computer was a new toy, and that was a natural thing to do at that time. Actually, my first contact with AI came with this book, not in 63, okay? I, I, I don't know whether I was, uh, I, okay, I, I've been born by then, actually. Okay, but in the early 80s when I was doing my bachelor's and found this book in a bookshelf, okay, with many papers about uh, programs that play chess, checkers, uh, proof theorems in logic and geometry and, and things like that, okay. So uh, if you look at the first decades, okay, so up to the 80s and even up to the 90s, okay, first you see that uh, AI sort of split into slightly different areas that once in a while they'll converge and they emerge again, okay, like planning and reasoning, learning, okay, language processing, vision and robotics, okay. Uh, do up to the 80s, I would say there was a lot of progress in uh, programs that uh, have very specialized abilities, the so-called expert systems. If you want a system that can make diagnosis of infectious diseases or, or, or things like that, so you could write the program by interviewing experts, and actually these programs did pretty well in comparison with the best experts, okay, in sort of finding uh, what, are, what is the uh, hidden disease, okay, that explains the patterns of symptoms. However, those programs that try to do, let's say, story understanding or trying to understand a joke and things, basically were not robust at all. Many dissertations were written at that time, but mainly the programs were used as demos, okay? So if you run the few examples that the author had, so you get, uh, some interesting result, but if you had a new example, okay, new scenario, okay, basically this program just broke down. Okay, by even the age of the 90s and even today, so there are no programs with the uh, normal abilities of a five-year-old child, uh, either motor, visual, or linguistic, even in some of these areas, this is beginning uh, to change, okay? 
And this also is relation with why we hear so much about AI in, uh, in the news, okay? Some applications, some, some interests of the uh, largest corporations, okay? Apple, Google, Facebook, IBM, and so on. So uh, we listen about uh, cars that can drive them themselves, so interacting uh, with a uh, mobile phone, okay, uh, by voice, okay? Even there is a very nice movie about that, about the guy that gets in love with the operating system, okay, of his phone. I would say that among all the AI movies, I think for me at least, that's probably one of the best, okay? And actually you say something true that, okay, for one reason or the other, people are very happy about interacting with machines and less happy about interacting with people, okay? So there is a problem there, okay? But it's a symptom. Okay, uh, also face recognition, okay, a number of other things, maybe in the last couple of years, so the, uh, a couple of breakthroughs, okay, that came from this uh, company, DeepMind, that was acquired by Google, is uh, um, a program that learns to play Atari, Atari video games just by looking basically at the pixel information in the screen and just at the score. Uh, and actually more recent in the last uh, few months, okay, a program that finally achieve top world level in the game of Go, okay? This is just in the last few months, okay? For those who don't remember, so a program that beat uh, Kasparov, okay? So the world champion was in 97. So it's basically 20 years since that level more or less were achieved in the game of chess and in the game of Go. Something in common about these different applications is that one way or the other, they tend to use some uh, uh, machine learning Technique. So let me go relatively quickly over uh, what these machine, basic machine learning techniques are. Let's say that we want a, a program to recognize uh, digits, okay, from zero to nine. Okay, so people write these digits in different way, and you want a program that will take an image, okay, of one of these digits and will output, okay, one of the 10 symbols, okay, from zero to nine. So you are in some sense classifying images, okay, into 10 classes, okay, corresponding to each one of the digits. Okay, it turns out if you want this function and you want to write a program that hand, okay, that program is going to be um, very brittle and not robust, okay, it's going to work from some uh, drawings is not going to work for many others. So the best technique for this and for many other problems, okay, that were sort of found uh, by people in the AI is that you don't want to write the program for this by hand, okay? The best approach, okay, currently for this is to learn this function from label examples. What it means, label examples, is I give you many of these pairs. So I give you an image and I tell you, okay, this is actually, this image contains actually a six. I give you this image and I say this actually contains a two. I give you this image and see this uh, image contains actually a seven and so on. So what you get is a set of label examples, so the inputs and the intended output. And the idea is that you're supposed to learn this function f okay, from this example. So the form of this function normally is a parametric function, so all what you are learning is not so much the form of the function, but the parameters of this function, often uh, by casting the problem as a problem of minimizing error and then applying some algorithm like gradient descent, okay, in, um, to minimize these zero squares and, and so on. Actually, one common function that is, is used is the so-called uh, uh, neural networks, okay, where in some sense the parameters, okay, are inspired, okay, are the function are inspired by the working of the uh, real, okay, uh, neural nets, even though this is just a, a, a metaphor. Uh, actually, for those of you that this seems a bit strange, so we are all familiar with this idea one way or the other, so the most common way in which this idea appears is in regression. You have a plane, with a bunch of points, okay, you see that in the newspaper all the time, and you're supposed to pass a line, okay, just to see some trend in some data. So the question is how you draw the line. So in some sense, what you're learning is a linear function that minimizes the square, uh, the square root with respect to all the, uh, the points, okay, that you have in the in that plane. So in that case, you are learning the parameters of a linear function. In most cases, in machine learning, okay, you deal with nonlinear functions that don't have the same uh, expressive uh, limitation. And in many other cases, okay, you either mix this idea of supervised learning where you're given inputs and outputs with ideas from unsupervised learning where you learn, okay, without an output or you learn from, re from uh, reinforcements and from penalties, as we'll see uh, uh, in a second. Actually, um, 
when you read things like this, okay, so that the Google brain, okay, can uh, find cuts in videos and things like that. So in some sense, okay, are these sort of techniques normally the ones that account for these uh, results? Normally, uh, the type of neural networks or the neural network techniques used is called in this case as deep learning. Normally, phrase deep learning refers to relatively old algorithms, okay, the algorithms that people have developed in the uh, in the 80s, okay, like backpropagation, that has ways to tune these weights, okay, uh, and supervise uh, learning, okay, but with more data, okay, with more layers of, of hidden weights, and of course with more CPU uh, power, okay. In some other cases, okay, for instance, this is also from I uh, think a couple of years ago. Okay, so this is about the deep mind uh, that learns how to play Atari games. I will talk a little bit more about these Atari games later on because it's something we have done work on. And in this case, so nobody is teaching, okay, how to move, let's say, the paddle in this case. So uh, the way that uh, this program learns is not by supervised learning. All the information that it has is just the pixel structure and the score. So it's a form of unsupervised learning where it's learning indirectly, okay, from uh, uh, penalties and rewards, okay? So uh, now, so machine learning methods, okay, they are uh, these days all over, okay? So if you really want to go to the industry and get a job, okay, uh, it's not a bad idea, okay, to get into that, okay? and to uh, put uh, uh, words like deep learning and big data and things uh, like that. But of course, all these machine learning techniques also have some limitations, okay? If from the point of view of general intelligence, that is in some sense one of the uh, originals and still sort of one of the current goals in artificial intelligence. So intelligence normally is associated with the ability to reason, plus or problems, uh, uh, thinking and so on. So even though the machine learning techniques, okay, so have produced impre impressive applications, so the idea that all there is, okay, okay, for knowledge is to associate uh, responses with uh, uh, inputs or stimuli, okay, it's, it looks like insufficient. In a sense, okay, this looks like a psychology uh, up to the 50s, what was called uh, behaviorism, okay, so in principle, actually, most of the human learning and uh, probably also in, in many animals as well, it's about how the physical and social worlds work and to use this knowledge for various purposes. Purposes like, for instance, generating behavior, okay, let's say behavior for achieving goals. So you use a model, a predictive model of the physical world in order to get the behavior without requiring, okay, so much training, so many, many examples and to have at the same time much more flexibility. Okay, uh, if you change the game, if something happens, okay, you still can reason about what's going on and don't have to, 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 to do it many, many times in order to uh, decide what to do. Or other things that these models of the physical and social worlds uh, can be used is also for interpreting the behavior of others, for sensing the world, for communicating with others and things like that. So many of these tasks actually not easy at all to be able to capture, okay, by just stimulus uh, responses, okay. And, uh, and that in some sense make you sort of systems that may be flexible certain inputs, okay, but have a sort of more limited functionality. If the goal changes of the problem, okay, all the experience that you, ha that you have, all these reactions that you learn in principle, okay, cannot be uh, used. So you have to learn it from scratch uh, uh, again. So uh, just to illustrate a little bit, okay, some of the things that we do in, in the AI group related to planning. So I'd like to illustrate what planning is about from the point of view of autonomous behavior, okay? So basically, if you want to program, okay, do you want to program an agent, a robot, okay, to be autonomous in a certain sense, so you don't have to tell it uh, uh, direct, okay, the agent. So you can do it basically in three ways. Either you can program the behavior by hand, okay? This corresponds to hardwiring the behavior. It's thought that nature does that, okay? For many elements and many circumstances and even uh, uh, for us in many cases as well. Second approach is, okay, you learn, okay? So it's very flexible, okay? You learn uh, from the experience. So you come like experience and you see, I mean, how to behave in, in, in terms of the results that you got. Now, there is a third approach, okay, that actually is relatively well known. Hopefully, this situation will change in the near future, and this is what we are struggling with, 
is that you don't specify the behavior by hand, okay? You don't have to worry it, not you have to learn it, but you derive it effectively, automatically, okay, from a model of the world. So basically, I have a model that allows me to make predictions. How can I use this model that allow me to make predictions in order to derive the control, to derive what to do, okay? So let me just go very quickly over an example, okay? So of course, those that take my class, I've seen this example uh, many times. Uh, those familiar with the AI basic textbook, okay? I'm taking this example from a uh, textbook by Storvassel and Peter Norvig. So here is the problem that you have. There is an agent, it's this guy here. This guy wants to get to the goal, okay? But in order to get to the goal, he has to avoid meeting this dangerous monster, okay, called the Wumpus, and he has to avoid falling in one of these pits. Okay, the problem will be trivial, okay? But the issue is the guy does not know where the goal is, does not know where the Wumpus is, does not know anything, okay? but it knows how the world works. So it knows that if it's here and it moves to the right, it's gonna be in this cell. And it also knows it has some sensors. So even though it does not know where all these things are, so there are some sensors that give partial information about the true state of the system. So if you're at distance one from the Wumpus, okay, you're gonna sense some bad smell. Okay, so, you, so let's say you move here and you sense a bad smell, so conclusion is that there must be a wumpus here or here. Not here, because you were here and there were no wumpus here. Same thing with the pits. All these pits, if you are so at distance one, okay, you can detect some signal, okay, that says, okay, there is a pit at distance one, so this is a bridge. So I move here and the uh, conclusion is there has to be a pit either here or here, okay? So now, so you can take this problem and approach this problem in these three different ways. So one homework that you can give to students is give me a controller for this guy in this particular world. Okay, just program the controller by hand. Second approach is use some sort of learning algorithm. Okay, that every time that the guy dies in a pit or with a wumpus and so on, without achieving the goal of getting to the goal, it gets penalized. Okay. And the idea is how to uh, optimize the world. Third approach is given that I know how the sensors work, okay, how the actions work in the world, okay, figure out, okay, given the goal that you want to get to the goals, what to do. Actually, the solution to this problem, so you start here. Let's say you move right. You see, okay, you sense something. So this is not safe, this is not safe. So the best thing that you can do is to go back. You go back, okay, you move here, again, you see a signal, so Wumpus uh, in principle could be here or here, okay? And, but you were here before, so you didn't sense any smell, so this cell has, contains no Wumpus, no pit, so you can move safely here. But you have to integrate the information from the sensors, okay, in order to, uh, to get finally to the goal. So it's a very simple problem, you can tackle it in different ways. Actually, they're not very good machine learning algorithms, even to tackle something as simple as this one. Okay, and uh, of course, it's not too inter interesting from a, the point of view of AI to have a controller written by hand because you have a controller written by hand for this particular problem that is not going to work for another problem. What I want to have is something that is generic, okay, that can handle variables, can actions that change the values of variables, sensors, and so on. And I plug this problem in the input and I get a controller in the output, no matter what the problem uh, uh, is about. So to see some of the computational challenges in this, okay, so I'll focus only on the simplest type of planning setting. In the simplest form of planning setting, what you have is a set of variables, okay, with a set of possible values. You have a set of actions. The actions, okay, can change the values of some of the variables, okay? For simplicity, we we'll assume deterministically. So you know, if you apply this action, which variable is going to change and how. And you want to find a sequence of actions that is going to map some initial values of these variables that you know into some goal values. By the way, this is an extremely simple model. And this problem here, it's very hard to fit into this other model. Okay, why? Because in this problem, there is incomplete information. So the initial state 
features a number of things that you do not know. You do not know where the wumpus is, where the pits are, even where the thing you're looking for is. Okay? So this is a much simplified setting, but it's still pretty generic. Okay? The idea in planning is to come up with this box where you put problems of this form in this sort of variables, what are the initial values, what are the goal values that you want okay, in the desired situation, and what actions you have available and how they change the values of the variable. And the idea in this case is to come up with an open loop control, just a sequence of actions because there is no feedback in this model. Okay, so it's a very simple type of model. So people in AI call this a classical by vanilla planning because it's the most simple type of model. Okay, of course, there are many richer models, models that involve incomplete information about the state where you are, okay, needed for dealing with the problem I had before, stochastic action sensors, okay, models that are as powerful as they are called partially observable Markov decision processes, and I'm not going to get into that, but basically there are many ways to make this type of model much more interesting and challenging. However, even this stupid, very simple model is already computationally intractable, meaning that if you try to solve problems with a few variables, okay, even with 20 variables, and you are not careful, okay, things are not going to be solved. You're not going to get the behavior. Things will explode. An example of this, okay, so I have this box. I want to build this generic box, and I want to be able to input problems, okay? I don't care what the problems are. As long as I can model them as a set of variables, uh, actions that change the value of variables, and an initial situation that you start, and a final situation I want to reach. In this case, the variables will be the location of blocks, and the actions basically allow you to change blocks from one place to the other. Well, it turns out that finding a plan, okay, so the behavior that achieves the goal from the initial situation is finding a path in the graph, okay? However, what is the problem, okay, that the size of the graph is exponential in the number of variables? Okay, so this is sometimes not so easy to grasp for people that care about scalability, but this is a crucial problem. It's a key source of insight, as we will see as well. For instance, for 20 blocks, okay, this graph will contain more than 10 to the 24 nodes, okay? So, bunch of zeros. So, and this looks like a stupid problem, okay? Just solving a, a blocks problem where you have to go from one configuration to the other by just unstacking and stacking blocks. So the question is, how can you find paths that connect a given node to a target node, okay, in such huge graphs, okay? There's no time of the universe that will be sufficient, okay, to explore as many nodes as the ones that we have here. Okay, related to this, okay, there is another idea that related to Turing insight, okay? So Turing, what it shows is that there are certain perfectly well-defined problems that cannot be solved in finite time. These are non-decidable problems, okay? Starting from the 80s, okay, so 50 years, okay, almost 50 years after Turing original papers, people also use okay, Turing machines to establish another boundary between the problems that in principle can be solved efficiently in polynomial time versus those that cannot be solved apparently in polynomial time. There are people in computer science, normally they call these problems NP-hard, you heard about NP-complete problems and so on, and the NP is not that it's not polynomial, but it is polynomial in a non-deterministic, non-physical Turing machine that you cannot actually implement, okay? So people discovered, and actually one of the open problems, okay, if you solve this problem, okay, you get the Turing award and probably more than that, is whether this frontier between the problems that can be solved efficiently and those that apparently cannot be solved, okay, that are NP-hard, okay, so they are actually there is a line there or not. So this is the question of P okay, whether it's equal or not to NP, something that is not unsolved, but everybody in computer science will think that the two things are different, that one class is polynomial, problems with polynomial time solutions, the other problems that require exponential time, sometimes even double exponential time as, as well. So these sort of exponential time problems include all the planning problems where in order to consider the feature, so the number of possible features to look at grows exponentially with the horizon, okay? So, uh, 
basically choosing actions, getting a behavior from models. So you have predictions. So the problem of using a predictive model to get behavior is computationally intractable. So the point is, even if you have good predictions, it doesn't mean that you can figure out what to do. The problem of figuring out what to do remains computationally hard. And this is what the work in planning is aimed for, okay? Dealing with this computational challenge, where in some sense evaluating the future by considering all the possibilities like solving a huge mental maze. So the question is, how planners do this these days? Okay, I'm just talking about the simplest type of planners, this vanilla, where everything is deterministic, actions change variables in a, in a way that you know, and so on. Actually, this is another question for those interested in how the uh, brain works, okay, is how brains achieve anything like this. Of course, you can say that the, 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 the brains don't have to deal with these huge mental mazes, but it's an, an hypothesis, okay? So uh, there is no reason in principle that if you get AI systems to consider and to select efficiently course of action by considering futures, okay, this cannot give some insight into uh, what the mind is doing. Actually, I would say that computational limits, not computers themselves. For many people in cognitive science, they use the computer to run their algorithms, okay? That's one use, okay? But the most interesting use is to understand the computational limits to see, okay, how you can tackle this problem. Because if you don't exploit automatically the structure of problems, okay, you cannot deal with them. And we don't know how the brain works, but it's pretty robust and it doesn't break due to the number of variables, okay? So that is a basic computational challenge, okay? So if you look at this challenge from the point of view, you can get some insight into uh, how the brain does. Actually, one of the solutions that people have found for this problem, actually the solution, so it came from, from working in, in, in a group, is the following, very simple idea, okay? Even though finding a path in these huge mazes, okay, is something that's still intractable in the worst case, what you can get is estimates. So I am in, in, this, in this state and I can do three actions. I can take block A, uh, sorry, block C and put it on A, I can take block A and put it on the table, I can take uh, what? Block A and put it on top of C, okay? So the same idea applies when you have 50 blocks, doesn't matter. The point is, it's very easy to compute estimates of the distance to go, okay? So I can compute in polynomial time, low polynomial time, I can compute automatically, no matter what the problem is about. One is expressed in terms of variables, actions that change the value of variables and so on. No, nope, I don't care what domain it is, okay? I can, in a domain-independent way, in a generic way, I can get in low polynomial times numbers that give me some sense of direction to the search. So if you go this way, it looks you're gonna be at distance three, okay, from where you want to go. If you go like this, okay, it looks that you're gonna be at distance two. These are just estimates, they don't have to be accurate, okay? To get completely accurate, estimates will be as hard as solving the problem itself. Okay, well here again you get three. In this case, the estimates are so good that if in each case you move, okay, you take the action that takes you closer to the goal according to these heuristic estimates, okay, you just solve the problem with no search at all. Actually, some of the methods used to get these estimates allow you also to, in a part node, to tell you which are the nodes that are even worth evaluating. So here I can say these two guys are not even worth evaluating. I know they're not going to be good, okay? So basically you get, not just by evaluating all the possible things that you can do in a state, but if you want something that has a relation, let's say, though the ways that uh, uh, people play chess, okay? People don't consider the possible moves, okay? They get very, very much immediately which are the moves, okay, that make sense to evaluate and to consider in a more detailed way. So by looking at the computational problem and at the computational challenge, so you get techniques like this one, okay? Getting these appraisals automatically in a domain-independent way, that are not only computationally effective, okay, but at the same time, okay, have some cognitive appeal, okay, in case we might want to talk more about that later. Okay, so uh, more generally in, in, in AI and within the group, we not only consider this type of mathematical models, okay, but we consider a variety of models. So some of the models that we consider, for instance, are, uh, 
constraint uh, satisfaction and SAT, where the task is to find a value assignment to a set of variables that satisfies a set of constraints. In the case of SAT, the variables are Boolean and the constraints are clauses. The generalization of this is called constraint satisfaction. Okay, so there are many, many problems okay, that can be mapped as SAT or constraint satisfaction problems. Okay, many other problems, for instance, involve reasoning with probabilities. Okay, so Bayesian networks is a graphical language for expressing uh, uh, probabilistic knowledge on top of graphs. And the task there is how to find a posterior probability over some variables given some observations. A uh, third problem is actually a variation of the one we talk about. What happens if you are doing planning with incomplete information and you get feedback? Okay, if there is uncertainty, it makes sense to sense the environment. So the problem I mentioned before, this little game, the Wumpus, okay, you need to sense the environment in order to figure out what to do next. In those cases, the idea is how to get a strategy, just not just a sequence of actions, because what you do is going to depend on what you observe. And of course, there are models that involve not just one actor, but many actors. These are called the multi-agent problems that bring a number of subtleties that way, and that relate also to ideas in game theory and so on. What is, okay, in all these cases, what people in AI and what we try to develop are these boxes, okay? So we are trying to develop programs that will take any instance of these problems or the planning problem of a planning with feedback of a basic network and at the same time compute approximate solutions. You cannot guarantee you're going to get optimal solutions. You're not going to guarantee that you're going to solve all the problems because all these problems are computationally intractable. Okay? They are sometimes the algorithms when they are complete, sometimes are exponential, sometimes are double exponential. But the point is to push this sort of uh, 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 ex combinatorial explosion as far as possible. Some of the models are actually uh, particularly expressive. Okay? Some uh, planning models, these ones called POMDPs, okay, are relatively, as some people call them, AI complete. That means if you could have okay, a solver that will take any compact representation of a partially observable probabilistic problem in the input and to tell you what to do in the output, okay, you will be a long way to having a generic and a general intelligence. Okay? But these are sort of very intractable problems where the key issue is how to do cost-effective inference in order to scale up. Okay? It's not just to have an algorithm that is complete and correct. Nobody cares. Okay, okay, of course, you care. Okay? But that's not the challenge. Okay? The challenge is to be able to scale uh, up. Actually, the methodology in all these areas these days in AI, as opposed to what I mentioned before, where people did demos okay, up to the 80s, is based on benchmarks and competition. Because in the worst case, all these models are computationally hopeless. Okay? But in practice, okay, many, many problems okay, can be actually solved. So SAT, for instance, is a problem that is NP-complete, meaning that in the worst case, any algorithm will take exponential time. Okay? But on the other hand, if you feed a problem to SAT involving 100,000 variables and 100,000 clauses, okay, it's likely it's going to work very well. Okay, define these uh, worst case behaviors. So you want, in some sense, the worst case behavior to be exhibited only on the worst case instances, okay, that are normally not normally the instance that one is dealing with. Now, many of these cases, there are competitions, so it's relatively easy to enter in any of these things. Okay? You have a very good idea about how to exploit the structure for any of these models. So the best way okay, to go around, you enter into the competitions, you do well in the competition, you win the competition, and then people pay attention okay, to the technique that you have. They cannot avoid okay, doing that, something otherwise it often, often happens in, inside. Actually, uh, among the relatively new competition is this general video game competition that has started in 2015, the idea of this competition, you submit one of these boxes, and the people organizing the competition, they get this box, they feed it with video games that you have not seen, and they basically score the different solvers according to how well they do in the video games. Same thing with the planning competition and so on. You submit your boxes, okay, they feed it with different sort of problems. You have no idea what the problem is about, just the mathematical structure, okay? And, and all these solutions are, are, are evaluated in this, in this way. Actually, some of the benefits of this generic approach, these generic algorithms, is suddenly you may get new problems, 
Okay, and you can take from yourself one of these genetic algorithms and use it. Okay, so I'll show just uh, results uh, from one of these uh, algorithms also on the Atari uh, video games. So basically, this setting, okay, uh, was so this interface and this setting, okay, not the algorithms, but the simulation setting was done by people in Alberta a couple of years ago, three years ago, okay, actually it's the setting that the people in DeepMind use when they publish a nature paper about how to learn how to do these things in, uh, through deep reinforcement learning and, and, and so on, okay, uh, we took some algorithms, okay, that we developed uh, in the past, okay, with a, a couple of former students of the group, Nir uh, and, and Mikkel, and we say, so this looks, again, the mathematical structure of the problem looks that it's one that is very well fit to the genetic algorithms that we have. So let's try it and let's see what we get, okay? And actually, it's a very simple paper, okay? to write because it's taking an algorithm off the shelf, just adapting it to the interface, and at the end you get an algorithm that can play any of these games. And this is the algorithm that you develop for something that is completely different, okay? You see, it can relatively discover that it's a good strategy, okay, once you get past the block to uh, knock all the things uh, on, on top. The same algorithm, for instance, is used in, uh, actually, uh, so the same algorithm, okay, again, was not developed for any of these settings. It's completely generic. This is another game. And actually, in this, uh, uh, by the way, this algorithm of ours does, tends to do much better than the algorithms of deep mind, okay? Even though there is, it's fair to say that these, the two things are computing slightly different things. So in this famous sort of uh, uh, um, uh, paper and results that they have, they, they learn a reactive controller. We don't do a reactive controller. We use the simulator to simulate a little bit into the future. But again, so the number of possibilities is huge and to select the action to do. Actually, in these, in these domains, they do pretty bad, okay? Because in general, Monte Carlo methods will not do well in this type of, of set. I'm not gonna get tired with the more examples of these, but some of the applications of these genetic algorithms that we are looking into, okay, right now, are in video games, in robotics, and slowly, okay, we want to get into issues that have to do with dialogue, okay? Uh, again, that these are goal-directed activities, okay? In some sense, it's planned with incomplete information. In the case of dialogue, it's also a multi-agent problem, okay? Where you have to model not only your beliefs about the world, but also the beliefs about the other guy believes as, as well. Okay, so how am I doing in terms of time? So I think I'm doing very well. What did I do with the slides? I lost them. Okay, no, thank you. Okay, where, Guillem, help me. Where is, uh, where is this presentation? Okay, here, here, okay. You can ask questions, okay, in the meantime. If no, let's see. Okay, quickly, quickly, quickly. Okay, so it's time to wrap up. So, of course, I didn't get into AI to play Atari, okay? I wanted to get to the mysteries of the universe, okay? Our place in the universe, okay? So where we are, where we are going. And, of course, uh, one of the appeals in AI is uh, to use the computational perspective to tackle some interesting issues. Actually, questions like, can a machine think? I always want to make fun of this question. I said we have made a big progress. In the 50s, the question was, can machines think? Now, okay, 60 years later, so the question is, can people think? Okay, so big progress there. Okay, uh, second question, can a machine be 100% rational? Okay, okay, the only guys who will say, uh, probably yes, okay, that even think that people are 100% rational, are who? Economists, okay? okay uh, in computer science, we know that's impossible. You cannot be, be a 100 rational even in, in a logic as simple as propositional logic because all these models are computationally intractable. Okay, so if you understand, okay, the limits of computation, all these questions have a very trivial answer. 
By the way, one of the founders of the field of artificial intelligence is also one of the founders of what's called the School of Bounded Rationality in Economics. And the guy actually got a Nobel Prize in Economics before founding, okay, with other people in the eyes, Edward Simon, okay? And he was very well aware of that uh, problem. Uh, another one that I like, okay, so can a machine have free will, okay? So uh, uh, the question I like to pose actually is, does a chess plain program, okay, uh, uh, have free will? Of course, the answer from everyone will be, of course, it does not, okay? It's just limited to choose one of the moves from a fixed repertoire, okay, by applying some evaluation function. Okay, good. Now we change the chess playing program, and now I allow you, I allow this guy to play many other things, even to play life, and it still works the same way. Many options. Okay, looks ahead into the future and decides what to do. Okay, does now uh, this program uh, has uh, have free will or it doesn't? In principle, again, the tendency will be, okay, it is no free will, because from the outside, if I know how the program works, in principle, I could predict, okay, which action is was going to, to take. Okay, now the question I'm going to, going to answer here is just to, to pose some question is whether there is another sort of free will worth having or that you may have in a relatively materialistic world, okay? But, okay, I'll, I'll keep the others, okay, reaching to some of the mystery. Okay, I mentioned at the beginning about the fears of artificial intelligence, okay, there are people talk about the singularity, okay, that uh, soon machines, okay, will be uh, more intelligent than people, and then there's going to be an exponential explosion because they're going to be even better machines and so on. Okay, so my point of view is that that's nonsense. Okay, that's nonsense, okay, uh, whether you take this story to be utopic or dystopic, okay, it's, uh, it's like uh, some people said, it's overpopulation in Mars. It's, it's not in the foreseeable future. However, there are some other problems that are in the near future, and one of these is automation, okay, so automation is a big problem, okay, and it's a big question, it's about high society. Okay, who is going to, to deal with automation, where the, in principle some jobs okay, may end up going and uh, um, may not come back as normally has happened uh, in, the, in the past. Okay? Now, of course, you can take an optimistic view and say, okay, so how come in a society, so if you want to work less, there is more, less work to do, that's going to be a negative effect. It looks that that will be a positive effect, so, okay, less work to do, but as things are now, Okay, it's not good to be without a job. Okay, so, uh, uh, so in principle, it's down there. Actually, so I would say that many of the problems raised by automation and artificial intelligence, in some sense, has to do with this as well. Okay, uh, have to do with, uh, uh, with society. Okay, so we are scientists, but before being scientists, okay, we are uh, citizens. Okay, and of course, okay, uh, the, uh, we want that all these technological developments uh, benefit society at large. And, uh, and it's clear that the interests of society and the interests of corporations are not always perfectly aligned, okay, to say at the least, okay? So the question is what we do as, as citizens when we are not clicking likes and things in, 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 in the Facebook. So actually, uh, I think I have this, uh, I couldn't avoid bringing one, uh, uh, one thing from El Roto. So El Roto in Spanish says, I don't know if this is readable at all. So estamos desarrollando máquinas inteligentes como hombres, eh, no, estamos desarrollando máquinas inteligentes como hombres para hombres estúpidos como máquinas. Oh, here, my bad translation in English, we're building machines that are like intelligent like people for people that are stupid. Uh, like machines, okay? So uh, I think it's very acute and uh, we can talk about uh, this uh, too, okay? Uh, just to wrap up, uh, I think so what we have seen in the press, okay, two things. One is about fears of artificial intelligence, about applications normally having to do uh, with the uh, use of data and, and, and machine learning, okay? So the idea that this is the arrival of artificial intelligence Okay, that's uh, still a long way to go. 
okay, to get something resembling okay, the generality and flexibility of human uh, intelligence is, 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 is like if you just, uh, if you climb on top of a tree, okay, that doesn't mean that necessarily you are closer to the moon, okay? So the moon is still a uh, uh, long way uh, to go. Uh, there are many things that machine uh, learning techniques are not intended to do, and normally they don't do. It's about uh, taking action, okay, by evaluating the possible futures. That's a critical notion for us uh, humans, and of course, it's also critical for any notion of of uh, of, a, um, of general intelligence. About this, by the way, okay, I, it's good to mention that this company, DeepMind, for instance, has shown that they can get very good reactive chess and go players, okay? Meaning without looking into the future. So that what they have done is that they, so traditional chess playing programs, they look into the future, okay? So I see, this is what I do, what the other will respond, what I responded to the guy, then they go several levels and then they uh, uh, back chain, okay? Uh, the value of the different outcomes and then they do what appears to be best given the possible response of the other guy. Okay, normally programs behave this way. Now machine learning, so in the case of Go and in the case of chess, some people have shown that you can get pretty good uh, chess playing programs and even Go playing programs, okay, that's a bit harder, okay, but just learning such a value function that you don't have to look in the future, just one step. You do one step and your evaluation function is so good, okay, that in principle, okay, you don't need to look further. Okay, so in some sense, this cast doubts about, so what is the importance of, uh, of uh, looking into the future if these programs and this company are is showing that you can do pretty well by learning techniques, okay, in some sense, learning reactions that just look one step into the future. Now, one thing about this is that they learn these value functions, okay, for a very specific games using many, many examples. So these programs that I do this, okay, they don't have any flexibility, okay? This program that just plays chess can not play any other type of situation. The same thing about the learning that went into the Go program, only plays Go, okay? So the idea that you need to look into the future, okay, is related to the idea of generality. If you have something general, it's very hard to learn a value function that will span all the possible situations that uh, may arise, okay? Uh, something else, still AI is, uh, I would say, far from the capacities of a five-year-old child. I heard the uh, Erin it's, it's, it's now heading an AI center somewhere, he said uh, about deep learning and all this news, that this is, is not the end. He, he said this is not the beginning of the end of artificial intelligence. He said this is not even the beginning of the beginning. Uh, maybe I will not go that far, but there still are many things okay to be done. Of course, uh, in spite of that, you can do pretty well in, in, in many different types of needs. Uh, just one last thing, okay, so many uh, immediate, okay, uh, risk and possibilities, but uh, this requires uh, uh, informed uh, and concerned citizens, okay, so if you know of uh, one of these, so let me know. Okay, uh, okay, thank you. Okay, I'm the organizer, I introduce myself, but I also take the questions, okay? Uh, so, easy ones first. Horacio. Thank you for the very entertaining talk. Um, uh, I have a question regarding the general solutions. Um, I wonder, uh, one, w once you have a problem, usually you have to model it, and usually you have to develop in, a, in features to represent your, uh, your model and features that are, manual, are humanly developed, say. Yeah. So how, um, how you um, use a generic solution in that case when a, a problem uh, may change and, or uh, has not the same, um, a structure of the same uh, a domain that the, the previous problem. So for example, if you play a game, maybe there are some um, characteristics that make them uni uniform to reuse the same features, but how, how you apply general uh, solutions to different problems, totally different problems. Okay, 
Uh, good question. So, uh, respect to the word features, okay? So, in this type of models, normally one talks about variables, variables that keep track of the state of a system. Normally, you're trying to control some system, okay, some environment, interactive with environment. There are variables, and in some sense, encode the state of the system. So what we need are these variables that encode a true state, okay, as some people call the Markovian state, so that in some sense when you reach a state, it doesn't matter how you get there, so for the future it all matters, so the state where you are in. So in a sense these variables are slightly different from what people call features in machine learning algorithms, that if you run the same algorithm, okay, by changing the features, and you have to do a lot of engineering so that, let's say, the classifier works correctly. So here in principle, so the issues are slightly uh, different. Now, machine learning and this type of model-based approach are connected in the way that in many cases, these models that we use okay, to take decisions, they can be learned and they should be learned from data. So ideally, okay, I want to be able to build these models okay, just by uh, a stream of inputs that only contain actions and observations. So I have a robot and I want a robot who wants to learn okay how to uh, use his arms to pick up a ball, let's say starting from scratch. So the optimal thing that you could do, okay, the ultimate challenge is just to learn the, the to let the robot build a model okay by just looking at streams of actions and observations. So it does different things, it observes different things, so it can infer the state space of the problem himself that here we take from given. And once that you build the model, then you can use this model not only to solve that particular problem, but it can be reused, okay? So I'll solve many other type of problems and even changing the goals, initial conditions, and so on. So what I'm saying is there is, there is not so much in a split. Actually, there is a, a whole branch of what is called reinforcement learning that is called model-based reinforcement learning where the idea is not to get reactions, but to learn the models themselves. So in some sense, in model-based reinforcement learning, the reinforcement learning problem is mapped, okay, actually into a planning problem. Okay, so the two things are, so even though I split them here, they are more connected than when they appear. In many other cases, if you're in an industry and have a problem, you have logistics and you have uh, the HL, and you want to deal with packages and this, so it's easy to model directly by hand. Okay, but you don't have to encode the solution, you just encode the dynamics of the problem, you encode the sensors, you encode all these other things. Mm -hmm. Good. Luca. Okay, I apologize for a very disorganized question. <laughs> I love them. really still the general problem solving kind uh, solver kind of uh, uh, paradigm and this paradigm at a certain point died at least as a point of reference and it, it, it only recently came back to life essentially you know. one of the reasons why it died it has to do at least in the ideology I don't I cannot talk about the technicalities from uh, some very weird uh, uh, ideas that were presented particularly by Jerry Fodor at a certain point, which was the following. Jerry Fodor was this philosopher, he's this philosopher who, uh, 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 on, on the one hand, he put clearly what I do, cognitive science, in the field of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. The idea that, uh, that he had was that essentially cognition is uh, uh, a computational discipline, not a biological discipline, for a reason that he could argue. Um, but at the same time, that what really a general problem solver want, wants to do is impossible in principle. The reason why it is impossible in principle is essentially because we solve lots of problems because we somewhat know how to uh, 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 evaluate the relevance of uh, uh, a piece of information on the fly, but there is no theory about relevance, period. Okay, so on the one hand, he said cognitive science is very, uh, uh, um, you know, very much a computational science. On the other hand, he, he said, the kind of thing we want to solve with the general problem solving is just really, in principle, go beyond what we can do. So the very first part of the question is, how much do you think this theory makes sense uh, uh, in your opinion? Because you are very much into the same kind of uh, dilemma. But then there is a second facet, which is 
so and that's where the question becomes a little more disorganized. But and it's part I'm more interested in. And uh, the best way to phrase this is the following: I can think. So we are these kind of beings who are really good at solving problems. Period. Um, so I would imagine that um, that there are many uh, hints that artificial intelligence can take from human behavior, not because we are, you know. Uh, the greatest, or not because we are the optimal sol problem solvers, we certainly are not, but because we just are the best around, essentially. And uh, uh, so I can imagine very many cases in which basic ideas of artificial intelligence or computer science in general have influenced a lot uh, cognitive science, starting from the difference between memory and programs, I mean, many, many of these kind of things. Do you think of any idea that we can provide that could influence the way you work or uh, in, a better in a better way. Can you give me an example in which any of the kind of problem solving that humans actually do has been factored in in the way you work to improve a way an algorithm works or uh, a kind of solution problem works? In other words, you know, um, First, about uh, Jerry Fodor's uh, the criticism and, and, and so on. So, uh, uh, I would say that this type of criticism, okay, of Jerry Fodor's problem, of course, didn't have any influence, okay, at all, okay, in, in AI or anything, okay. This as happens often with armchair philosophers, okay. So, so, you are in the trenches, okay, dealing with the algorithms and with these things. And this is a very generic sort of philosophical argument. So, the question is, uh, there are too many relevant scenes, so how, t how uh, okay, so it's related to what I'm saying. So given that you have hundreds of variables and only few of them are relevant, okay, so how do you do? How do you don't explode with the number of variables? That's precisely the computational issue, okay, and the, and the point that the novelty respect to what happened, let's say, in the early 60s, actually, as Lucas said, one of the first AI programs, okay, at all, was called the General Problem Solver. Actually, one of the authors was Evan Simon that I mentioned before, and the idea was very similar. You feed problems in the input, okay, and you get solutions in the output. What was the problem with the General Problem Solver? Is that it computationally it doesn't work. Okay, and I would say, and a lot of the work done in the 60s and 70s and up to 80s in AI was also very introspective. So people were trying to use insights or observations, okay, from psychology and so on. Simon in particular was sort of participant. But uh, uh, this type of introspective based AI in the 90s got a very bad reputation. So these days it's very hard to publish in an AI conference if your justification is this is the way that people do it. Okay, so what you have to show is that your method actually works and the way that it actually works or works much better than other methods around is to see problems with many, many variables and see whether your solver will break or not. Okay, so the challenge, in some sense, the, the Jerry Fodos is not an impediment, okay, is part of the challenge, okay, and there are many ideas that have been developed, okay, for addressing uh, this challenge, okay, that is part of the computational complexity. How not to have solvers that will break merely because the problem involves many variables, okay, there are problems that are inherently hard. I don't care about those, okay, so those, in that sense, I, so there is a notion that from a computational point of view, some problems you're not going to be able to solve. This is this intract and be hard. So it's, it's, of course, things that eventually will break. But the question is, when do they break? Do they break when you have 20 variables, or do they break when you have 1 million or, or, or 100 million? So it, it makes some difference. And this, in some sense, is what is being an issue. This is about the first part. Second part is about exchanges between, let's say, psychology, neuroscience, and, and AI. Okay, so there are some insights coming, let's say, from uh, psychology and so on that we can use computationally. So let me just briefly mention about the other way. As you mentioned, things like Bayesian networks, reinforcement learning, some of these ideas so are having some impact, okay, in some areas of neuroscience uh, and cognitive science. The other way, so uh, 
the, it's, it's not a good bridge to computation. So our problems are computationally. For instance, let's take the theory of mind. Okay. So the theory of mind is something in psychology is very much sort of in, in fashion for the last okay ten years or, or more, and um, is about the ability of people okay to deal with other people okay as, as different than objects. So there is a world of objects and there is a world of people. And there are many things and many abilities they have to have to do with people. So uh, psychologists give a lot of importance to the theory of mind. And actually even kids, okay, very uh, small uh, kids, okay, are, are very good about dealing with the beliefs of, of, of other kids, about the, uh, uh, their reactions and, and things like that, about stories, okay, that involve multiple agents and so on. But from a computational point of view, when you look at uh, this theory of mind ideas, you see, gee, it looks like magic. Okay, so uh, so this uh, uh, so and looks to me okay. Or to take another idea that to me I'm sort of impressed uh, how lightly is taken in, in, in let's say neuroscience in, in mirror neurons. Okay, so mirror neurons. So some people ascribe them sort of uh, things that are impossible to compute, and they are going to be computed when when neuron. That's crazy. That empathy is based on mirror neuron. That's a very complex thing. So. In a sense, there is, I would say that there is a, a, a big distance, okay? But, okay, have to do with computation. So we focus, so computation is already a very restricted game. So even those of us whose real interest is the human mind, we are sufficiently entertained, okay? By just paying attention, okay, to these restrictions while sort of not being able, okay, to assimilate or to use insights coming, let's say, from the behavioral uh, science. So that's why the, for instance, Bayesian networks, that are, they are all over, okay? When Julia Per published the book in 88, if you look at the, at the cover of the book, okay, in Bayesian networks, there is actually, is a picture of uh, Descartes, okay? It's basically showing that the guy has something like a Bayesian network in the head. So I made fun of, of Julia at that time, who was my advisor, and say, okay, so you are a true believer in Bayesian networks that you think that we have in the heads. But so years later, okay, you have many people from Berkeley, okay, Josh and some other people who actually use it, the whole theory of Bayesian networks to understand how babies, okay, so learn about causal relations and so on. So I would say that the computational perspective is very uh, uh, crucial and very interesting source of insight. And I'm not sure that people who are not working with this sort of uh, understand, okay, the importance of, of that. Why, by the way, why Bayesian networks were developed? Okay, probability theory existed for centuries, okay, so at least two centuries. But Judea developed Bayesian networks in some sense to make the computation of probability destructible. So the first Bayesian networks were trees, and rather than having exponential time inference, it's polynomial, it's actually linear in the number of variables. So many of these insights came by just trying to comply with certain computational restrictions. So I think even for understanding the mind, but that's pure speculation, it's, it's good to pay attention uh, to that. And that's also what makes it hard, the other exchange, okay? Uh, this long answer, okay? And people are getting hungry uh, and angry. Okay, any other uh, question? I promise to be short and quick. Okay, so I'll take this moment of hesitation to thank you for being here and uh, until next time.